a lot of raindrops during the night. The roof and the deck and the earth resounding. And now the rain has stopped. This morning somebody said, this is how it happens with thought at times, like the rain stops. There's no intention in that, no one doing anything. Is there listening right now, or is the rain starting up again, thinking? It doesn't stop for me, how come it stops for others? That's more rain, more dripping. To be heard and seen freely. Freely meaning without any need to judge it, to evaluate it. To bring me as I know myself in connection with what is being observed. The only connection that exists is thinking. It's my thoughts, my stopping, my practice, my success and my failures. It's all thinking. Quack. That's not thinking. Or is it? Can one see a thought arising? First there's the quack, quack. Is, is thought saying, or asking, is thinking always bad? It sounds when she talks, or there is something bad, something that shouldn't be. Then one isn't listening completely. One is listening from one's conditioned yes and no, good and bad, right and wrong. Thinking is what it is, and to be intimate with it. How it divides up oneself inwardly, divides oneself from the so-called others, from the world, from nature, from God. All the operation of thinking. thinking something into division which is not divided in actuality. Right at this moment, there's breathing. Is there? Isn't there? Not I gotta get back to my practice, just breathing. It's there. And chi 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 chi. The moment thought says, I'm breathing inside and the birds are singing outside, a division happens, which is not there in pure listening. thought may say, I can't get rid of thinking. It's impossible. It is so automatic, so overwhelming. It's all thinking about thinking. Is it possible for moments at a time to listen to this whole Niagara of thinking without getting caught up in the content of the thoughts? Just a chit 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 
of birding and thinking. And the breathing. Which is not mine or yours, it's breathing. It's not even that, but we're talking with each other. In silent listening, there is no such thing as breathing. Not a concept. What is it? And to listen. Freshly. And watch with amazement the operation of divisive thought. I am breathing. I can pay attention. I cannot. And the world is cut up, fragmented, instantly. One question has come up repeatedly and comes up winding its way throughout retreats in one form or another. This time it is. Isn't there a value scale to our actions or to people? That people who do good works for others are of greater value than those who don't, those who are engaged in violent or destructive activity or in greedy amassing of whatever human beings amass. Pinning it down further, the question was, isn't a refugee worker trying to alleviate the unspeakable misery of refugees. Right now it's Kosovo, Macedonia, but it is happening other places all over the world, people being thrown out of their country, their home. or escaping violence, death, is a refugee worker of greater value than a Milosevic, who's causing all this misery. Or a bomber who drops bombs in order to prevent Milosevic from carrying on. And of course, implied in the question is, shouldn't we do good work, self-effacing, helping others? Because it is of greater value to humanity, to this planet, the person used that expression, to this planet Earth. It's such an enormously complex topic, and yet so simple. What is help? What is good works? What is badness, destructiveness, violence? In the total scheme of things, of not just human consciousness, human evolution, but the evolution of this entire cosmos, which right now we believe started with an explosive Big Bang creating something out of nothing and dispersing it all over. And within this 
stuff being dispersed, new explosions, new creation, new destruction, new birth of galaxies, new destruction of suns and planetary systems. In organic evolution on this earth, organic we means the, the evolution of life evolving of life, unfolding is a bitter word yet. Life and death, living and dying, birth and dying are inseparable. And life itself for unfolding, continuing, propagating itself has no other nourishment than life itself, life living on life. Animals living on plants or each other, at times eliminating their hosts. It's not totally in perfect balance, but if a host is eliminated, it is. If a species dies out, it does. It's been the unfolding of life on this earth. Constant appearing and disappearing, evolving and devolving, so that by today, so scientists tell us, more species have been extinguished than are existent, and not just since the arrival of human beings, although they have aided in the process, maybe speeded it up. And of course, with the appearance of a human brain, its growth, making it possible to retain memories, to anticipate pleasure, sensuous pleasure, the pleasure of power, of possessions. All this is imaginable in the human brain, and not just imaginable. The, the imagination has instant, complete connection with the whole organism. its glands, its organs, its muscles to spring into action, to get what is imagined and wanted. Imagining it and then thinking, I could have that. I could get it for myself, my country, my family, my church. Which I think is not present in most animals, it doesn't look this way, the way they live. Not that animals are without memory or able to picture things, where they are, or remember things, where good hunting grounds are, good food. The deer certainly know where it tastes the best. <clears throat> remember it, come to the same place where something has been planted. But this fantastic ability to think of something and think of myself getting it, having it, enjoying it. I think it's unique to the human species. Likewise, of course, the ability to imagine dreadful things. Re remember dreadful past experiences, and this deep-seated fear it will happen again, and 
taking all kinds of precautions against something that may never happen again. So, is, is our human condition strongly affected by this ability to imagine what we want and imagine what we dread? And the power to get it or to escape from it, to defend ourselves against it. And not realizing until some, we talked about some wall cracking, the self-enclosing wall. When it cracks a bit, light comes in and shows up what is going on in the body-mind. And that what we're imagining and wanting to get is pure fiction and yet translatable into action. Or it can be let go of by remaining here in this present moment of Dadri and breathing and acting out of the fullness of this present moment, rather an imagined future scenario. Now, coming back to this value scale which we're grappling with, people are grappling with, isn't there a value to be assigned to each human being according to what they do for others selflessly? or what they do against others, injuring, hurting others, to aggrandize themselves. See, I can't approach it this way because, to me, the way I see it, we are one humanity, one human consciousness one evolution, one unfolding of life out of the very soil of life, which is our inheritance, our training, our conditioning, the circumstances, the climate in which we live, whether we've just been shattered by an earthquake, flooded out, or live in a paradisical land, good weather, lots of resources, maybe human beings minimally messing with it. Just saw a video of Costa Rica, it was unbelievable. There's still some country which is, seems to have some inherent order, no army. I don't know too much about it, but In, in this one human consciousness, one, one soil of evolution, there are all kinds of flowers and growths, weeds and, and precious blooms, trees, microbes, viruses, cancer cells. poisonous frogs and peepers who we so much love to listen to as it gets warmer. How, how can we differentiate who is what, who became this way or that way? It just happens due to 10 million influences on one person's life. Not that he or she decided to become this way. Of course, those thoughts may be there, but those thoughts are superimposed on an inevitable unfolding unless some light comes through the cracks, making some fundamental change possible. 
not change in the conditioning, but change in seeing it and maybe not going with it, because it is clearly revealed that it is a dead end, harmful, injurious to others, enhancing oneself at others' expense. That can become very clear at a moment of looking, of attending without this predominant self-center. Unless that happens, we muddle along the way everything formed us, whether it's a Milosevic or a, a refugee worker. All I can assign a value to is the totality of human evolution or consciousness, and that makes, that becomes meaningless. Is it good? Is it bad? It's just evolving, unfolding, in the midst of a huge, incomprehensible cosmos, with maybe other such systems of planets and life, around, who knows? See, when a question like this grabs one, one can explore inwardly too where it comes from. Do I feel that I'm doing useful work for others? That I'm helping others? And does that idea that I'm doing good works, fulfill some inner need, some inner, feel, inner feeling of lack, of not being worthwhile. But if I think that I'm doing something good, I feel more worthwhile, few less guilty conscience. It's okay to examine that. You can either do it together or by oneself, looking, discovering. How, what, what is the essence, the basis of what I think is my altruism, my concern for others, or for who I think are the others? Because in, in close examining, close viewing, one may realize that the others are not other than myself. Full of a feeling of lack, needing something, feeling incomplete due to the idea that one is separate from everything and everybody else. And as long as that idea persists and dominates our thinking and reacting, no matter what we do to fill the void, the lack, to feel good or important, does not satisfy. It is a bottomless pit. One finds out for oneself. No one needs to tell one. So, somebody asked that question very early on. It sort of got lost in this memory. How is it possible to dissolve this feeling of others? That was a question on day one or two. How does one do it? Is it possible? I'd like to go about that, to dissolve this feeling of others. Because that's not the way to go at it. I want to dissolve it. I means there are others. What, what am I? What is this persistent me and I that dominates the thinking and the acting? What is it? To, to trace it. To, to see it transparently in thought, 
I am important, not just thought, thought, feeling. I'm important or I'm unimportant. And the yearning to feel important it sort of feeds the organism with momentary energy. One feels one is important, others regard one as significant. And the addictive power of that, which constantly recreates this artificial division between me and the others who I need to feed my sense of importance. Just using this as an example. So what am I? Not as a mantra to be repeated. Oh, if that's what one wants to do, try it. Find out how far you can go with it. The brain is very happy to take up mechanical, repetitious things. It feels at ease when it has something to repeat. What am I? What are the others? To ask that, but then not to answer it in any conventional way, which is thinking about it, philosophizing about it, reading up on it, one has gone through all of that and hasn't brought satisfaction. I was going to say, something about leaving the retreat because people ask about that. How will some things that have worked here, the silence, maybe an insight, a feeling of togetherness, joy, beauty, or just plain the ability to be with all that frustrates one, the thoughts, the, the boredom, just being with it, can that happen in my daily life? Or is it all left behind here? Some people dreading to get back home. Into the, the chaos. No space to watch it, attend to it carefully. It's, it's a good thing not to have too many ideas how things are going to be at home when one gets back. And not to base it on how it was last time I came back from retreat. It was like this and this, and I totally fell out of the whole thing. <laughs> Sounds familiar? <laughs> This is what separates us from this moment, anticipating the next one and the next one and hoping it will be like this rather than that. What is this moment of at-homeness or in the busness, in the car, with people at work, with a family? It's a, is it possible for, for one moment, for one moment to stop, look, and listen, if it sort of occurs that I'm not the way I used to be at retreat? That's already a moment of attention, of course, covered with thought and memory and blame, judgment. Can, can we stop, look, and listen this moment? Not to say it's impossible to stop the onslaught of thought. It is possible to listen to the birds, the breathing. Maybe the, the traffic in the city or people rumbling around above one or below one in the apartment. The, 
the pressure of thoughts, what I have to do, what I should all get done, and I'll never be able to do it all. To, for a moment, listen to the pressure, listen to the rushing of sensations, tensions in the body. Not in order to resolve them, get rid of them, but because they're there. And beckon to be attended to, listened to, in a fresh way. Can we do one thing completely? Washing a dish? Or is the mind someplace else? Really completely there with the running water, the sensation of warmth, slipperiness, the hardness of the dish, the dripping of soap, the patterns it makes. Completely there from beginning to end. Not already with the next dish or what I have to do after the dishes are done. To notice this pile up of thoughts and anticipations and not go with it. Stay with what is here at hand, under our nose, under our feet, in front of our eyes. And not, not make a practice of it. Then comes the compulsion, I ought to do it and I didn't do it. I'm either good or I'm bad. Making progress or falling back. Which is thought construction taking away from the simpleness of a wet, dripping dish. Can we, can we work with that? Experiment with it? How often a day we're not with what we're doing, but anticipating what we ought to be doing and come back to what we're doing. It's so simple, even so difficult. And beware that pictures don't form how well I'm doing it. Because then we're in this tremendously strong impulse to become somebody in our own mind. the attender, the meditator, the good one, the bad one. And that's separating. Can we see that so clearly that it's, that it's natural to remain here without making ourselves into something over it? To abstain from that even though it's alluring, addictive, it needs to be noticed, time and time again. So it makes way for attention without the image about myself. Dripping, cawing, breathing. Are we here? Or someplace else, in judgment, in reverie, or here with a dripping and cawing and breathing, not knowing a next moment. Actually, in being here, there is no next moment. There's only here, this, now. of this being in this moment of nowness, of dripping and breathing and burning. It can be seen what needs to be done if something needs to be done with a family member, with a colleague. Somebody one works with, lives with commutes with. 
It is out of a un, an unself-centered moment of nowness. An unself-centered moment of nowness. That doing something for the so-called others happens. Unselfconsciously, naturally. Something needs to be done, so it gets done. If the story says, well, why should I do it? I always do so much, the others do so little. Then it's lost. Then it's dwelling in storyline. And then I, I have to do these, this for others because I ought to be good. Then it's not a genuine action of love born of this moment of being here in all simplicity. I'm not so sure that it matters whether this moment of being together and responding to each other's needs or to the, the whole situation's need, whether that's any different, whether it happens here or elsewhere. How could it matter? What matters that in this vast pool of human consciousness, there is some insight, some clarity somewhere, some freedom from enclosure that inevitably communicates itself. One knows not how. This beautiful statement of the chaos theory comes to mind. When a butterfly trembles or moves its wings, the whole universe trembles. A butterfly moving its wings, the entire universe trembles. It's not hard to understand. There's no division. may say, okay, I can see it theoretically, conceptually. But can it be seen immediately, directly, as a living truth? One raindrop moistens the entire earth. You could say, wait a minute, wait a minute. When it rains in western New York, Texas is still parched. Is Texas separate from here? Except in our mind. What are we? What are the others? 
this moment of listening without knowing. We will end here for today.